Hello, good afternoon, sorry, <laughs> forgot this. <laughs> good afternoon everyone and welcome to the afternoon session on what does climate resilience mean in practice? Um, my name is Maisa Rojas and I will be facilitating this session. Uh, I'm a climate scientist, I'm director of the Center for Climate and Resilience Research at the University of Chile, CR2, and CR2 is a technical secretariat to Race to Resilience. So, Race to Resilience is a UN-backed campaign for non-state actors to catalyze step changes in global ambition for climate resilience. Uh, it is centered around people and nature first. And we want to pursue a resilient world where we don't just survive climate shocks and other shocks, um, but we actually strive in them. Today in the morning, we heard from the Parakesh Partnership uh, their experience on how they are advancing resilience. We heard from uh, five of their sectors uh, and in particular, we heard uh, experiences from least developed countries and also from small island state countries, um, what they are doing to address resilience through the uh, Marrakesh Partnership um, uh, sectorial pathways. Now, the idea is to build on these resilient pathways and this afternoon, we will hear what the Race to Resilience partners are already doing on the ground to build resilience. Um, please note that we will have simultaneous translation in this session, so you have headphones uh, next to your chairs that, that you can use. And to start the session, I would like to invite David Holet, who is co-lead of the Race for Resilience and will introduce uh, some of the topics and concepts for the session. Thank you, David. The floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, uh, Miser. Um, great to see everybody today. And it's about going from pathways to action. Does anybody think we should not take action? Put your hand up. That's good. I think I'm in the right, right room. Um, so I'm going to try and kick it off, but it is all about action. And um, this works. There we go, yeah. This is uh, metrics, but last night we watched a uh, People on the Front Line, a new Sky documentary, which is really moving. If you haven't seen it, do watch it. You can watch it on Sky Catch Up because it was broadcast uh, on Sky News last Thursday. It was all about people living in Bangladesh and India, really at the front line of climate change. It was really moving. and. All of us in this room, probably, I think we're pretty privileged. We're being impacted by climate change, but it's the most vulnerable people who are being impacted by climate change. And this is just some data which McKinsey, uh, the consultants, did for us. But basically, a 1.5 degree world is not a safe world. Even when we're on 1.2 today, is not a safe world. We need to take action. So that's why the climate champions, and you, heard from Gonzalo this morning, Nigel will come on uh, to close the session. It's all about people. So, picture, I should know her name, but this is from the World Agroforestry Centre. So it's all about people like uh, this farmer here. So it's also, it's about, it's a global campaign. As we've seen dramatically this year, people lose their lives in Germany from a flood, as they do in Bangladesh. People suffer from a heat wave and forest fires in California as they do in Greece or Australia. People suffer from droughts, whether they're in California or in Burkina Faso. So it's for, this is a global campaign for everybody. And we're putting people at the center and nature at the center of this campaign. And we'll come on to a bit on the metrics in a moment. So it's all about that. But it's also about not just surviving in the face of climate change. We need people to thrive. So that's a big challenge. It also means we must get to 1.5 degrees. So that's why the champions have raced to zero, 
to drive down emissions as quickly as possible. But we are locked into climate change, so we need a race to resilience to help people adapt and cope with the impacts of climate change. A really nice big goal, four billion. Uh, most of those are living perhaps in, in developing countries and small island states. Probably doesn't include, I'm obviously English, but hopefully Emma Howard Boyd, who's not here, she's very clear, she's the chair of the Environment Agency. It's also important for people in, in England or Scotland or South Africa, Nelisa. Um, I should have said also, there's one person with a pink mask on. He's my co-lead, Jorge Gastelmundi. Uh, yeah. For some reason, the, the, the PR people gave us pink anyway, so we have to stay, we strawberry pink anyway. So, and he, he was a, a driving force in putting people at the heart of it. And I was sort of, do we really put four billion? Isn't that a little bit optimistic? Anyway, it's, I think we may well get beyond that, and we have to. Um, I think you probably know all of this. We've got three communities, urban, coastal, and rural. Again, hands up a person who's not in one of those communities. Okay, so it is a, glo it's a global campaign. And obviously, really important, putting knowledge at the heart of it. Inclusion is really important uh, and cutting across. So, and those are three of our partners. I think we're probably hearing from some of them uh, later on about what they're doing. And I do want them to hear what they're doing, not what they're thinking about doing. So it's all about action, not about talking. Um, yeah, so it it's, is people on the front line. Um, again, keep thinking about that Sky documentary we watched last night. Uh, Anna Jones, the presenter, came. We had a, a Q&A with the producer, uh, with Gonzalo, Emma Howard Boyd, Tazin Jeffrey from the Climate Justice, and the Vice Minister from Peru. Um, it's people on the front line. Mark, you're probably also on the front line, but maybe not as much as those uh, fisher folk in that, in that boat. Um, it's also why, if you haven't seen them, look at the locally led adaptation principles. But it's all about local. So in Race to Resilience, we need to think, how do we operationalize those? And it's also about equity and about climate justice. So how do we deliver a just, sustainable, fairer world? Um, it is about tracking our action. I could have put metrics up there or indicators or frameworks, but we've got to communicate this to, to everybody. It's about what we are doing <coughs> and delivering. So for the first time, I think Anya's probably, I don't know if she's over there, she can wave madly, and Daniela from CR2 uh, can wave madly, because there's, there's a fantastic team that uh, Nigel and Gonzalo have assembled. So, first time we, we're tracking that, it was announced today. Uh, also, importantly, um, I think we can excited some results. Yeah. Great that so the Race to Resilient Partners, and that's not all of them, have said they're going to benefit 2.3 billion people. That's great, but if you're just counting numbers, that's not so great. It's got to be the quality of what you do. And as Pro Professor Slim Hook would challenge me, if I didn't say it, it's all about four billion people's stories or to be making sure that it's quality that counts. Obviously, working in a whole range of countries, uh, raised a bit of cash, but not enough. I don't think three billion sounds a lot, but when we listened to Mark Carney launch the GFANS on whenever it was last week, my, I can't remember days at all, probably like you, he said 130 trillion of assets have been uh, have, have committed to net zero. He did talk a bit about resilience, but six billion, uh, three billion sounds quite small compared to 130 trillion. There's probably a lot of noughts off the end there. Um, crucially, it's about nature as well. So there's a whole sort of website or the page about, about the, the metrics. They're not perfect, but the end, if, we, if we wait for the perfect metrics or indicators, we'd work forever. We need these to take action. Because uh, as soon as someone says, yeah, I, I want to build the resilience of, of people, uh, in my business, in my city, they say, what do I measure? And we can't say, as an academic, it's very difficult and context-specific. So we're going to have to have these metrics, and hopefully the Race of Resilience Partners uh, will talk more about that. I think, see my clock ticking, and I've actually got to the final slide, but the message is, now put your hand up if you are in Race to Resilience. 
Great. Well, hopefully the rest of you will put your hands up in, in COP27 and also go out there and get everybody else uh, joining Race to Resilience. So, thank you, Mazen. Great. Thank you so much, David, for giving us this, this overview. And um, so the idea of the next session, where we will have uh, five speakers, is to really focus on the human center uh, actions that uh, the partners of Race to Resilience are already taking. And um, the panelists will speak of several of these actions that are listed in the Parakish Marrakesh Partnership for Global Action, um, Global Climate Action Resilience Pathway, really long name, yeah, and ah. And these are the nine actions, and, and you will see uh, they go from climate risk vulnerability assessment to nature-based solution uh, to sharing knowledge and best practices. So these are nine actions, and it is really important to understand that we really need to work on all of these nine actions together. But what we will concentrate today is on, on these uh, five actions, um, but remembering that it is, it is not enough, it's not sufficient to just think and act on one or two of them. So uh, here, here is the list of the speakers. Uh, that will speak to uh, one of these uh, five actions. And I, I will name them and then I, I will ask them to come uh, onto, onto the podium. So the first one is uh, Tiago Pampola, secretary. What happened? Can I? Okay, sorry, that was me probably. Um, secretary of Environment and Sustainability of the state of Rio de Janeiro. Thank you very much. Um, the second one is Savina Carluccio, a program director of the International Coalition for Sustainable Infrastructure. Thank you. Claudia Moreno, deputy executive director of Fundación es Espoir. And um, Tuga Alaskari, advisor for the secretary of the Insu Resilience Global Partnership. And Elizabeth Hausler, founder and CEO of Build Change. Okay, so first, it's my pleasure to welcome Secretary uh, Tiago Pampola, who is the Secretary of Environment and Sustainability of Rio de Janeiro State, which is a founding member of Regions Adapt and a member of Race to Resilience. Um, please note that Secretary Pampola will be speaking uh, through the translator in Portuguese, so please use your headphones. And um, I have two questions, and I, I will make them together so that he can, um, that, that you can answer those questions uh, together. So, first of all, I would like to start by asking you, what does Rio de Janeiro State do to increase resilience of people? And the second question is, how can climate risk vulnerability assessment, disclosure, and monitoring increase resilience to climate change. Governor, the floor is yours. Secretary. Boa tarde. Boa tarde a todas e todos. Cumprimentando todo o Marrakech Partners, cumprimentando todos os membros da coalizão Regions 4 e todos os, eh, os nossos ouvintes aqui hoje, meus demais colegas de mesa, eh, dizer um pouquinho da nossa realidade do estado do Rio de Janeiro, um estado eh, que tem eh, assuntos complexos 
um Estado baseado na economia do petróleo é, e, e do gás natural. E aí nasce a nossa complexidade. E os desafios da gente buscar uma transição energética justa. O Estado do Rio de Janeiro é, hoje tem 17 milhões de pessoas e os nossos desafios principais é, no que tange a resiliência climática é adaptar é, é, a infraestrutura, é, o melhor ordenamento urbano, onde as pessoas é, de classe mais, é, é, mais empobrecidas, com mais, mais dificuldades financeiras vivem, e eles buscam, é, muitas vezes, é, construções irregulares em, em, em comunidades carentes, em morros, é, relevos. E isso representa pessoas é, vivendo é, concentradas em lugares de risco, onde as encostas com excesso de chuva pode deslizar, pode criar uma série de acidentes. E também próximo de rios, córregos, corpos hídricos, isso tudo cria toda uma, uma, uma complexidade é, para a gente poder é, gerir, ah, sobretudo, os efeitos é, dos eventos extremos que nos impõem as mudanças climáticas. É, o, o nosso Estado vem sofrendo muito com os eventos extremos, é, atrelado à falta de infraestrutura urbana e ordenamento urbano, é, e recentemente... É, nós é, fizemos o um levantamento e já investimos mais de um bilhão de reais para poder retratar uma grande tragédia que aconteceu no ano de 2011, onde é, mais de mil pessoas perderam suas vidas e 30 mil pessoas ficaram desalojadas na região serrana do estado do Rio de Janeiro. É, e essa situação aconteceu por excesso de chuva e falta de infraestrutura e ordenamento urbano. E, realmente, até hoje, nós lamentamos muito a tragédia ocorrida, com muitas vítimas, e é um motivo de muita preocupação, porque, permanentemente, todo verão, isso acontece. Nos invernos, a seca, com os incêndios florestais, e no verão, o excesso de chuva, com a falta de infraestrutura urbana, e as enchentes, e com elas, a perda de... É, vidas e bens das pessoas. E quais são as ações que o Estado do Rio de Janeiro tem tomado para reverter esse quadro? Primeiro, acreditamos é, na recomposição florestal, de avançar na política de reflorestamento de Mata Atlântica. Essa, sem dúvida nenhuma, é a medida mais assertiva que nós temos e nós temos programas contundentes que caminham nesse sentido, como o Florestas do Amanhã, que é um programa de fundamental importância, onde nós já temos é, um fundo que chama Fundo da Mata Atlântica, com mais de 400 milhões de reais, é, que representam os 100 milhões de euros é, em caixa, para poder promover ação, ações de reflorestamento. Então, nós fizemos um mapeamento de áreas degradadas, principalmente áreas urbanas, e estamos destinando esses recursos para poder reflorestar e compensar é, é, esse, todo esse desgaste ambiental, a questão do clima, do aquecimento dessas áreas urbanas. Então, a gente entra com recomposição florestal é, e eu acho que essa é a política mais acertada que nós estamos tomando. Já estamos com, é, contrata, com um contrato assinado de quase 5 mil hectares, de mais de 5 mil hectares, né, com o horizonte de ampliar muito através de parcerias, porque nós já temos esse, esses recursos de 410 milhões na moeda local em caixa, e isso pode representar também uma forma de contrapartida para a gente poder absorver aí, é, apoio internacional e a gente está aproveitando muito bem esse ambiente da COP para poder buscar essas parcerias. Temos o Conexão Mata Atlântica, um outro programa estratégico nosso, que através dos pagamentos por serviços ambientais, nós estamos conseguindo é, a, a ter os nossos proprietários rurais, que também sofrem muito com as emergências climáticas, no momento em que a gente tem as enchentes, é, as, toda a produção agrícola é, de um período inteiro de verão, que é onde é, a gente tem uma produção mais próspera, coloca-se muito a perder. Né? Então, toda, toda a produção agrícola se perde. É, isso tem um, toda uma cadeia negativa que, 
que, é, que acontece é, em decorrência disso. Então, a gente apoia, inclusive financeiramente, para esse proprietário rural manter as suas reservas legais, né, que é, hoje está determinada de forma legal em 20%, manter as áreas de proteção é, permanente, manter as nascentes protegidas. Então, a gente apoia com recursos financeiros diretos, Estado, proprietário, é, eu acho que essa é uma política muito adequada para a realidade que nós vivemos hoje no Estado do Rio de Janeiro. E também apoiamos os municípios através de, um, de uma distribuição de tributos. Nós temos um tributo no Estado do Rio de Janeiro, que é o Imposto de Circulação, Mercadorias e Serviços, e esse tributo nós fazemos um ranking, é, através desse tributo nós separamos é, 2,5% do, do, da totalidade que esse tributo é arrecadado para o Estado, e nós fazemos um ranqueamento é, de todos os municípios é, em, em relação à gestão ambiental, à qualidade da gestão ambiental. Então, nós temos 92, 92 cidades no Estado, e essas 92 cidades são ranqueadas. E, levando em consideração da primeira até a, a última, é, em ranqueamento, a gente vai é, destinando parte desse recurso, desse tributo, para apoiar os municípios que, cumprem metas estabelecidas, é, cumprem critérios de sustentabilidade estabelecidos ne, no rigor dessa lei que a gente criou. E hoje é, nós anunciamos aqui na COP é, uma inovação, onde a gente acrescenta mais um índice, que é o um índice é, de adaptação às mudanças climáticas. O que os municípios, o que as cidades têm feito para apoiar a população, para apoiar né, o planeta em relação a fazer as suas adaptações locais, a, a, a investir é, na, na contenção das mudanças climáticas. Então, esse apoio, esse aporte financeiro, também o Estado tem feito, e é uma política já em andamento, isso é muito importante dizer, não é algo que a gente está planejando, é algo que a gente já está executando. É... Então, hoje, é, esse é o cenário né, do Estado, coisas que... Nós entendemos que são políticas afirmativas, que a gente é, vai atrás das pessoas, que a gente apoia verdadeiramente. Fora isso, é, obras estruturais, né, para a gente poder conter as cheias, para a gente poder também é, visualizar de que forma nós podemos proteger o nosso bioma principal, o segundo maior é, é, bioma ameaçado de extinção do planeta, né, que é um, um, um grande hotspot, que é a nossa floresta é, principal do estado do Rio de Janeiro, a Mata Atlântica. Hoje, nós do Rio de Janeiro somos um estado é, é, conservacionista, a gente, a gente tem mais de 509 é, cons, é, unidades de conservação protegendo a Mata Atlântica, mas ainda é pouco diante a, a, o desafio é, que nos impõe a pressão antrópica, a pressão da, 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 da sociedade né, que cresce de forma desordenada e vai diminuindo a nossa cobertura florestal. E por isso nós também temos um programa né, que é um grande, um grande mapa, um, um, um grande olho, que a gente chama de olho no verde, é, onde através de imagens de alta resolução a gente consegue é, visualizar nosso fragmento florestal, identificar no detalhe se foi... Algum, se, se alguma, alguma mudança na vegetação foi decorrência de queimadas, foi decorrência de desmatamento ilegal, construção irregular em unidade de conservação, e aí rapidamente a gente consegue acionar nossas forças policiais, nosso, é, nossa mobilização é, local para poder atuar e, e, co, e, e coibir esse tipo de ação. Então, tudo isso conectado representa a nossa resiliência. E, por fim, para não tomar mais o tempo dos senhores, dizer que o Estado do Rio de Janeiro reporta é, permanentemente, e nunca deixamos de fazer, né, o, a plataforma CDP, né, para que a gente possa estar tá atualizado, estar tá, é, conferindo através da transparência que o Estado é, é, faz questão de, 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 é, de impor, de implantar, é, aqui para vocês poderem também visualizar tudo que a gente tem feito é, e nós estamos contratando é, já e aí é um processo que ainda está para começar é, o sistema de, é, de controle de vulnerabilidade de mudanças climáticas para que a gente possa observar tudo isso de forma sistêmica e é, aprimorar a ferramenta de controle e gestão é, no que tange aos eventos extremos e como isso impacta a população 
É, no mais, eu queria agradecer, eu me coloco à disposição para contribuir com respostas a perguntas que aparecer e é, convido a todos é, a participar do nosso grande evento que ano que vem nós vamos é, recepcionar o mundo é, no estado do Rio de Janeiro, que é o Rio Mais 30, para a gente comemorar né, os, os 30 anos da Eco 92 e a gente está ansioso para receber a todos no estado do Rio de Janeiro para discutir ODS e Agenda 2030. Meu muito obrigado, uma boa tarde a todos. Thank you, obrigado. Thank you so much, Secretary, for for sharing all the work that you are doing. So um, now the 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 second intervention, I would like uh, to invite uh, Savina, and um, so the questions. So, so, so Savina is from the International Coalition of Sustainable Infrastructure and uh, this coalition is the voice of the engineering community on infrastructure, uh, sustainability, resilience and climate action. It places engineers at the front line of climate action, harnessing their ability to provide solution and matching it with urgent need demanded by delivering through strategic partnerships, scaling up through leadership and knowledge sharing and tracking global uh, impact. So, Savina, the, the question to you. Wait, let me, I think, can I have the... Well, the question, the question to you is how your coalition um, helps to increase resilience in people. And I'm also, of course, specifically interested in hearing how the sharing of knowledge and best practice on climate risk management increase resilience to climate change. Thank you, Maisa. Good afternoon and thanks for having me today. It's my privilege to talk to you about the Race to Resilience Initiative of the International Coalition for Sustainable Infrastructure, which focuses on reporting climate resilient infrastructure projects delivered by the engineering community. Because of this, the, our initiative has a direct connection to impact on the ground and can be delivered at scale. Right now, trillions of dollars worth of infrastructure is being planned, designed, constructed, managed and upgraded, with sometimes little consideration for long-term climate change impacts. The difficulty of making infrastructure decisions is exacerbated by uncertainties about the size, the kind, the timing and the location of climate and natural hazard impacts. However, uncertainty should not be used as an argument to postpone action. Managing the physical climate risk is a complex proposition and one that requires coordination from across the value chain of infrastructure to ensure that resilience value is embedded, is built on and is not eroded. Therefore, in order to strengthen and build future collaborations and investments into resilience, we need to share knowledge, experiences and solutions on climate risk management alongside climate resilience and adaptation. This will enable, enable and empower everyone working on planning, delivery and management of infrastructure to take, to take that action to embed climate change resilience in their day-to-day -day practice. Today, I'm very excited to announce that Infrastructure Pathways, an initiative by the International Coalition for Sustainable Infrastructure, led by the Resilience Shift in partnership with AROP, is launched today. Infrastructure Pathways is a resource for practitioners in search of clear, easy to navigate guidance on climate resilient infrastructure. The website platform is live, you can go and check it out, and the link has been shared on social media. And we have got cards with a QR code here today. Infrastructure Pathways aims to organize, explain and link key existing information, guidance and tools from hundreds of resources on climate resilient infrastructure in each phase of infrastructure development, providing practical, mutually reinforcing actions for practitioners and creating a golden thread across systems and practitioners. Using Infrastructure Pathways will foster more informed decision making, improve coordination and better collective impact from practitioners across the infrastructure life cycle to better manage climate risks and to embed climate resilience and adaptation. Infrastructure Pathways is a live platform which will evolve as new resources become available and in time, it will become a community of practice. 
our Race to Resilience initiative is about mobilizing the engineering community to build and enhance climate resilience of infrastructure through the work they do. One of our key activities will be to collate the data and example of infrastructure projects that have climate risk management and implementation of climate resilience and adaptation measures as key objectives. We will be able to use the data to report on the impact of the engineering communities to increase the resilience of vulnerable communities and natural systems and we will publish a state of engineering report every year that presents the progress alongside a collation of best practice, pra practice examples. Another tool for, to share knowledge and best practice is our innovation project database to be published at the upcoming international conference to, for sustainable infrastructure organized by the American Society of Civil Engineers next month. This is going to be a searchable database designed with a user-friendly framework collating global innovations, their best practices and government champions based on global infrastructure research and unique engineering-based performance criteria. I have another exciting announcement to make today. So all this knowledge and best practice will be shared on a global scale through co-hosting the Institution of Civil Engineers Brunel series. The series will provide a platform for dialogue with high-profile city leaders across the globe while focusing on practical engineering issues in tackling climate change at the local level. The next series will start in spring 2022 and in 18 months it will deliver six regional events and post-event roundtable discussions. It will be a fantastic opportunity to bring together engineers and decision makers to discuss solutions to local issues. So to conclude, Engineering organizations and infrastructure owners and operators who want to be change leaders can join the Race to Resilience through us, the International Coalition for Sustainable Infrastructure. Together we will catalyze the engineering community to deliver a world in which communities and nature thrive in the face of complex and uncertain climate risks. So we stand ready for action. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Savina, for, for sharing uh, the streamline of climate uh, risk management into, into infrastructure. Very important. So now I know why I was waiting for someone. Uh, the, the next speaker will be, will be online. It will be a video. Um, and it represents an initiative that focuses on leveraging economic and resilient potential of nature-based solutions for the most vulnerable. Um, it's called uh, Scale for Resilience in, as, is a young and innovative initiative in the race to resilience. Uh, it is led by Yapu Solutions together with uh, SIAD and CGEIR and uh, Kawa Capital. Scale for Resilience aims to make 3 million smallholder farms more resilient by 2030 by providing access to finance for nature-based solutions. Um, Scale for Resilience currently represents more than uh, 70 uh, MFIs in Latin America and will launch its operation in Africa by the end of November. Uh, and um, Claudia Moreno will tell us more about this in a short video. Reciban un saludo cordial desde la mitad del mundo, desde el Ecuador. Les saluda Claudia Moreno, soy subdirectora ejecutiva de Fundación Espuar. Fundación Espuar es una ONG especializada en microcrédito con educación. Trabajamos bajo la metodología de banca comunal y crédito individual. El 75% de nuestras clientes son mujeres y el 75% se encuentra en área rural. En su mayoría, microempresarios pobres que no tienen acceso a la banca tradicional. Nuestra misión se encuentra alineada con los objetivos del milenio, principalmente en cuanto a la lucha contra la pobreza, igualdad de oportunidades y la protección del medio ambiente. Estamos orgullosos de ser parte de la iniciativa Scales for Resilience. Trabajamos juntos en una intervención de triple impacto en dimensiones económicas, sociales y ambientales. Buscamos principalmente que pequeños agricultores sean más resilientes, aprovechando los beneficios de las soluciones basadas en la naturaleza. 
Para los que no estén familiarizados con el término soluciones basadas en la naturaleza, se trata de medidas productivas que primero aumenten la resiliencia contra el cambio climático, dos, aumenten la productividad, tres, no dañen la naturaleza. Lo ideal es que estas medidas cumplan estas tres características, pero no pueden tener un efecto negativo en una de ellas por definición. Desde Fundación Espoar hemos generado un producto verde enfocado en atender la lógica económica de inversiones climáticas y ambientales a nivel individual de un cliente y con ese entendimiento buscamos implementar soluciones climáticas y productivas transformadoras, tales como sistemas de riego, almacenamiento de semilla, rotación de cultivos, reservorio de agua, diversificación de cultivos y perforación de agua. Un ingrediente importante, especialmente en el contexto de Scase for Resilience, es que aprovechamos un software para capturar los datos de los clientes, así como los datos económicos de estas soluciones basadas en la naturaleza para el análisis del crédito. A través de este proceso digital, los riesgos climáticos se incluyen automáticamente en el análisis crediticio y estamos en condiciones de conocer la realidad productiva de nuestros clientes finales, los pequeños agricultores. Nuestra institución cuenta con una estrategia de finanzas de adaptación al cambio climático que permite cumplir con los siguientes resultados. Mejorar la eficiencia de los pequeños agricultores y la calidad de la producción. Mejorar la resiliencia socioeconómica y climática de los clientes y por ende, mejorar su perfil de riesgo crediticio. Y finalmente, mejorar la gestión de ecosistemas y por lo tanto, asegurar la salud de los mismos y de su provisión de servicios. Desde las microfinanzas, también podemos ser protagonistas en la problemática del cambio climático. Les invito a sumarse a la iniciativa de Scase for Resilience, y trabajar juntos para impulsar la resiliencia de quienes más lo necesitan. Buenos días. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Claudia. So now it's the turn to hear from Tuga Alaskari. And she is from Insu Resilience. And let me introduce a little bit uh, the Insu Resilience Global Partnership, which is an initiative Uh, of over 100 members. Um, it's a coalition of governments, development partners, private sectors, civil society organization and academia. And INSU Resilience Global Partnership is striving to foster climate and disaster risk finance and insurance as part of a broader resilience building agenda. I have two questions for you as well. And the first one, if you can explain what does Insu Resilience to to increase resilience of people. Thank you very much. Um, so to begin with, actually, I want to acknowledge the great work that the Race to Resilience, the Marrakesh Partnership, and David and Jorge's team have done to push our conversation further. Um, so talking about um, the role that Insu Resilience tries to drive uh, within the broader resilience agenda, um, you know, there is real recognition, um, especially this year, after we've all suffered um, under corona, and seeing the impact of not having plans in place and money to support it, um, to be able to respond effectively when there is a crisis. And what the Insure Resilience Global Partnership does is working through a very diverse um, set of partners, a grand coalition of actors that all have different things to contribute to this, working together towards a common vision of scaling up access to disaster risk finance and insurance, making sure the money is needed when it is there when it is needed most, and making sure that it's backed by action, and making sure this is embedded within national strategic frameworks. Um, one of the things that um, has really given me a lot of hope this COP is Just the last cup, we were still talking about why this model makes sense, why it is important to have disastrous financing and insurance um, systems in place before a disaster strikes. I don't feel we need to have that conversation now. 
and thanks to the work of the Race to Resilience group, constantly pushing and asking us, you know, about how far we've come. We find we can't bring up the speeches from the past. We have to come with something new. We have to show the progress. And if you allow me, I'd like to talk about what we bring to this COP. Um, so one of the, we have three key deliverables that we've brought to this uh, conference. One of them is um, on the Monday at the, uh, at the Resilience Hub, we launched an evidence roadmap. This builds on the work of uh, many of our members. It establishes a framework upon which we can measure impact. So while the Ensure Resilience Vision 2025 has as one of its indicators that we want to have 500 million people covered by disaster risk finance and insurance, we recognize that that number is not enough for us to have the impact that we want to see in terms of resilience. The evidence roadmap will ensure that we understand how disaster risk finance and insurance approaches are contributing to a broader resilience agenda. What it means for poverty, what it means for um, an adaptation to the increasing climate risks in the future. Um, this framework is, um, it sets out the questions that we think should be asked in order for us to critique disaster risk financing and insurance and ensure that it is having the impact um, that would yield the resilience uh, image and plans that we have. This is something that we now will work with members of our partnership to start to fill these gaps, to start to look into and have analytical studies that look at each of the questions set out within the evidence roadmap and then we can really start to assess our impact. A second deliverable we have, again, very strong after coming out of the COVID pandemic, we're still in it, but seeing the devastation that it can cause, there is increasing understanding of the importance of having financing mobilized early, but also recognizing the limited fiscal space that some governments have. And so last week on Wednesday, uh, following endorsement by our high level governing body, we launched premium financing and capital support principles. We recognize that there is a need for partners to support countries and individuals in accessing these disaster risk finance and insurance solutions. But also we recognize that any sort of subsidy or support needs to be fitting into um, a strategy, a sustainable strategy. So what is that? And the premium financing principle seeks to map that out. The final deliverable we have, again focusing on impact, recognizing the importance of taking a closer look at gender and recognizing that there is a massive gap in our understanding of how climate disaster risk finance and insurance initiatives are affecting different people of different genders. It's my greatest honor that tomorrow we will be launching the Insure Resilience Center of Excellence on Gender Smart Solutions. It will be an online repository of information which will gather information that exists on the differential impacts of climate shocks, the differential impacts of the solutions that are proposed and looking at the entry points and potential barriers that could be faced. It will also seek to identify the gaps and commission research to fill them. It will, it will also commission guidance notes. We recognize that sometimes we have research, it identifies the gaps and the recommendations, but it's not necessarily clear how that can be converted to action. So we'll be looking at the how, how do we ensure that we achieve these targets. It also has two other pillars. One of them is opportunity. We currently have a scholarship program that um, identifies women in leadership in insurance supervisory bodies. And we, we cover the cost of their participation in a leadership and diversity program at the University of Oxford Sa uh, Said business program. But what's interesting about this as well is, and this is where the transformation comes, we, we um, encourage these leaders participating in the scholarship program to bring with them a policy idea, a reform that they wish to see in their countries. And they have the opportunity to work on this with experts. So when they return to their country, not only do they have get greater knowledge and understanding of uh, the gender, the nexus between gender and insurance, but also they're able to support and drive a transformation of a sector in their own countries. And the final pillar that we have in the Centre of Excellence is um, its community. We're looking to set up an expert uh, directory. We have currently an event series. And the idea is to really do basically what David and Jorge keep making us do 
have these dialogues, have exchanges, really start to move the conversation forward. Um, and so that's, that's where we are at the moment. That's, that's brilliant. My, my second question is, but you already touched quite, quite a bit on this, uh, uh, by doing all these references to the, to the pandemic and how that has shown us how important it is to talk about resilience. Is, if you could say very shortly just something about social protection as well. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that um, even though I've personally worked in this field for over 12 years, I think the COVID pandemic really brought it home and we understood how, what vulnerability truly means when the systems are not there to protect those that need it. Not only for people that are vulnerable, but on an institutional level, all of us, I think, at some point felt qu quite some fear about the hospitals in our countries and wh what would happen and how our employment could be um, impacted and how the future looked and what would happen to our family. And, and, and one of the things that struck me really hard early on was this concept of solidarity. It was the first time it was clear that we would not get out of this if we didn't all take action. And I think this, for me, it just was a moment where it all came together. I understood, we always talk about how it is so important to have disastrous finance and insurance initiatives that support um, in the case of disasters, but I understood why we needed to do it together. And I think that's something that I really, and in a sense, it enabled us to have that dialogue around premium financing, which before was quite taboo. It was, you know, is there commitment to disastrous finance and insurance if, if we subsidize the premium? Um, is it sustainable? What is the exit strategy? And it suddenly made me realize when we were talking about the COVID pandemic that this is not what this is about. This is about doing aid better. This is about doing development better. This is about running countries better. And this is finding a cost effective way of ensuring that we act and we respond to disasters but also in a manner that does not keep us um, you know, falling deeper, deeper in the wrong direction um, from resilience. Um, it makes so much sense, even from a development perspective, to invest a small amount in these systems that have proven that they can deliver responses very quickly. And what that means in terms of development, in terms of economic growth, in, in terms of human development is massive. Um, and I think that the last period, the last almost two years now of Corona has really brought that home, I feel. Thank you so much, Tuga. Thank you so much. So the last uh, now panelist on, on this panel is Dr. Elizabeth Hausler. Uh, she's a founder and CEO of Build Change, a system change catalyst for disaster resilient housing. Build Change is operated in 24 countries and counting made um, 93,000 buildings safer and helped to protect 1.8 billion in housing infrastructure assets uh, worldwide. Um, Build Change is the leading organization in the Resilient Housing Initiative uh, within Race to Resilient, which is a collaboration of over 100 governments, banks, philanthropists and tech solutions standardizing access to resilient, climate-smart housing worldwide. Um, Elizabeth, I have two questions as well for you. I will make them together this time. Um, so we are interested to hear about what resilient housing does for increased climate resilience of people. And then in particular, uh, how can climate risk governments and capacity building increase resilience to climate change? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Hausler, the founder and CEO of Build Change. Um, it's great to be here this afternoon. At Build Change, we believe that every house should be disaster resilient. And we've uh, enabled uh, nearly 500,000 people in 24 countries to live in disaster resilient housing. Um, we operate in the climate change adaptation space, like almost everyone else in this room. And so I want to sincerely congratulate David and the Race to Resilience for making resilience a part of the agenda. We cannot go on and, and tackle climate change without resilience being a key part of the dialogue. So here's the problem. Two, by, by 2030, 
40% of the population will be living in vulnerable housing. I'm not sure quite how that maps to 3.9 billion you showed earlier, but it's pretty similar, right? So hurricanes, typhoons, floods, fires, all of these disasters are, are not going away. Like David said, we're locked, we're locked into climate change. So we need to work with folks to build houses that were, will withstand um, the disaster. So we, climate change is exacerbating inequalities. Uh, women and children are 14 times more likely to die in a disaster than men. But people don't necessarily need new homes. They need more disaster resilient homes. So imagine the climate footprint of having to rebuild every single house after a disaster. So there are all sorts of reasons we should invest in resilient building. What Build Change does is very simple. We, we, we build and strengthen housing to withstand disaster. But then it's more complicated, really, when it comes down to it. So we don't actually build buildings for people, but rather we create an ecosystem in which disaster-resilient housing becomes the norm. We do things like partnering with microfinance agencies to facilitate access to financing. We also partner with government subsidy programs to open up bottlenecks that are preventing those subsidies from being used for disaster resilient homes. So we also work very much from the top down on policy advocacy, but on the ground up, showing that it can be done, that it's cost effective and efficient to strengthen existing housing, and always with people at the center of the process leading the efforts and making decisions about their own family and keeping their families safe. We recent, we've, we recently launched the Build Change Guide to Resilient Housing. You can find it at our website, buildchange.org. I've got a QR code here if you want to come up and scan it later. This document is all about action. It takes Build Change's uh, nearly 20 years of experience and puts case studies as well as operational processes in place so that folks can implement resilient, ho resilient housing programs. We have in it the Resilient Housing Ecosystem Assessment Tool, which is a simple checklist that governments, um, nonprofits, other, other leaders can uh, check through to see where you are on your path to resilient housing. So every action across uh, the Marrakesh, Marrakesh Partnership, it touches on housing, right? So I've been asked to talk about, talk about capacity building and climate uh, risk governance. So I'm going to kind of take those two together, but start with capacity building. So for build change, capacity building was, in the early days, about training builders and engineers. I am both. I am a builder and an engineer. My dad is a skilled brick block and stone mason. So he worked for 50 years, owned a construction business. And guess what I did for my summer job in high school and college? I work for my dad as a builder. I'm a bricklayer. So this capacity building, this training, uh, uh, this building the capacity of skilled trades, skilled trades people is such a rewarding and rich thing to do. Build Change has so far built the capacity of 78,000 people and created 30, 33,000 jobs in the construction sector. This creates a supply of skilled workforce, but it doesn't create demand for resilient housing. For, so for that, we need to go to other sources, the homeowners themselves enabling them to understand how to reduce their risk and improve their house that not only resists the next disaster, but improves their daily lives. But if we're really going to change policy, if we're really going to change, change the resilient housing ecosystem at scale, we have to change policy. So that's where governments must lead. So I want to give an example that overlaps between capacity building and climate risk governance from Dominica. Um, Dominica was hit by a pretty devastating hur hurricane in 2017, Hurricane Maria. And, and, and take, take a listen to these statistics. $930 million in damage. Uh, Dominica lost 224% of their GDP in two days. Imagine that, losing 224% of your GDP in two days. It's incredible. Over a third of total damages were in housing and 90% of the housing on Dominica was damaged. So as, as a result of this, so Dominica has hurricanes on an annual basis. So they had not only the, not only the challenge of rebuilding after this disaster, but also the opportunity to build better, to, to resist the next disaster. So the government needed a robust MIS, a robust system, in order to engage people in the process. So we worked with them to set up a system that would 
uh, allow people to apply uh, for government support, uh, create a um, grievance mechanism, um, it, it enable uh, contractors to um, engage with the process, provide tranche subsidy disbursements, um, check for existing hazards on the land. So it wasn't capacity building, though, really. It was a collaboration. It was really about working together. We brought the subject matter expertise on how to rebuild houses after disasters over 17 years, uh, the coding hub to develop the MIS, but it was the government's policy framework that we worked within and the World Bank at, and other donor support. So bringing these parties together, the institutional strengthening, the homeowners not knowing what they want, um, and creating efficiency at scale, this is how we're going to reach these goals of creating resilient housing for everyone. So much of the discussion at COP and outside has been on increasing energy efficiency in housing, as it should be. Um, there's a need uh, for that, but we can't stop there. If we are going to be resilient to climate change, we must strengthen existing housing, and it is possible to do so through this mix of innovative policy, access to financing, capacity building, climate risk governments, and all, governance, and all of the above. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And um, I, would, I would like to thank our, our four speakers here on stage and, and the video we had as well for such an impressive illustration of what a Race to Resilience is, is already doing. So I, I invite you to, to go in, in, and sit in the front um, row. And now I, I would like to invite uh, Mark Harvey on stage. He's founder and CEO of Resurgence, um, which is a global social enterprise that creates inclusive weather and early warning services for climate resilient cities and communities and also supports uh, urban climate risk reduction. And I will go and sit now <laughs> because the idea is to have a conversation. Hello there, Maisa. Hi, hi. Very, very nice. Yeah. Very nice to see you here. And um, so, yeah, the idea it would be to um, talk a bit about how we can scale up actions to increase resilience. Yes, so good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mark Harvey, the CEO of Resurgence. Delighted to be here and to be part of the, the Race to Resilience. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our transformation initiative, Daraja, uh, one of the seven uh, Race to Resilience transformation initiatives, and also share some, some thoughts on how we, how we scale up, because I think a number of the speakers have, have mentioned this issue of efficient scaling, and, and there is this big question, because the need is so large that how do we find models that allow us to, to expand this impactful work that was demonstrated by the other four panelists. Coming back to Daraja, uh, the story of Daraja begins in, Niro in Nairobi um, three years ago, where we were doing research there with the residents of informal settlements, and 56% uh, of them told us that although they were living within line of sight of the skyscrapers, within line of sight of the, um, the observation equipment of the National Weather Agency, they didn't get any, um, any weather information or any, any early warnings, which was quite shocking to us. Um, so we decided to create a collaborative solution with them. We called it Daraja. Uh, Daraja is Swahili for bridge. We were looking for a Swahili word. We were inspired by Ushahidi, uh, uh, something else that had come out of East Africa. We wanted to create something uh, transformative, something that would create a bridge uh, between the, the residents of the informal settlements of Nairobi, who numbered well over 45, 50% of the city population, essential to the lifeblood of the, the city community and the economy. We wanted to create that bridge between them and the National Weather Agency. Um, and we were aware there was that huge need. So we did four things. Um, we, we created a system uh, we, get, we convened the National Weather Agency, the forecasters from the Kenya Meteorological Department, uh, with the residents, with community leaders at the table. But we also brought in other actors in the city system who had responsibility 
for them or who had their trust. So, for instance, we brought in these city authorities, uh, the infrastructure services people, civil contingency. We brought in the Red Cross. Uh, we brought in the, the city media and community media all around the table uh, to do a second thing at that systems level, which was to co-design from scratch a, uh, a city level forecast. Uh, and we went deeply into design of everything. The, the zoning of the forecast, so they could see their settlements in the map of the forecast, the weather icons, uh, the language. So we, we found a mechanism to move from English into Swahili and also into urban patois or sheng. Mm -hmm. So we worked at those levels, but not just the, the forecasts and the early warnings, uh, but also the pilot awareness activities to generate interest and trust in the forecast. There was a big trust issue lack of confidence in the accuracy of the forecasts. Um, and we also worked on the channels of dissemination. So the communities chose the channels through which they would receive the forecasts and early warnings. Um, because we knew, again, because of this trust issue, that actually putting the early warnings through official channels would make them largely irrelevant at times because of a trust issue. Um, so deep co-design across all those areas. Um, a third thing we, we, we did was we abandoned this idea of first mile, last mile in early warning system design, right? Um, that behind that is a view that the last mile is somehow less important. And there's also a linear view of communication that, that information moves uh, as an arrow, as it were, in one direction. This is outmoded communications thinking of the 1960s. We heard the word ecosystem a lot on this panel in the last hour. We took an ecosystems-based approach to information flow and to um, climate risk information use and uptake uh, by being really interested in the actors in the system that take, curate, amplify, transform information and in the feedback loops back into the, weather, the, the, uh, the National Weather Agency. So we created a new system through which the, um, the residents, the community leaders, chose the channels and the feedback loops back into the National Weather Agency. And lastly, we did a fourth thing, which was to not just focus on early warning and think about those high impact weather events, but to work with the Kenya Meteorological Department and with the community development partners on a, a service, a forecasting service, which provided daily and weekly weather information for everyday living that would help the residents make decisions about how to commute across the city, which clothes to wear, uh, which produce to buy, um, and to actually see that kind of daily weather information on a kind of a continuum with the extreme weather information so that actually when uh, high impact weather events and when an early warning was triggered they were already used to using those channels so the early warning system did not become a white elephant so i think that spectrum of kind of regular uh, adaptation related information is very important uh, what are the results of that or what were the results after 18 months that figure of 56% had actually jumped up to 93% 90, access. Uh, in the settlements we were working, there was a 98% early action rate, action on the information, not just access, action. 75% of the residents said that they, they saved money on the basis of the Daraja service. The savings were coming from forecasts that allowed them to for instance, move their possessions higher up into their dwellings, or perhaps um, make decisions about if they were uh, traders about buying produce in advance, um, um, moving their beds or their television sets or the radios to safer places. But they, they, they cited a very high kind of rate of avoided damage and loss that we were able to, 
convert into a, a benefit cost ratio of the service in the city of, of 20 to 1, which is um, between two and five times the normal rate of early warning systems design. So um, we think that, and we're, we think that Daraja has something to offer urbanizing uh, Africa, Asia, parts of Latin America and the Caribbean where national weather agencies have struggled to keep up with urbanization. They've tended to focus on uh, farmers, uh, fisher folk, the aviation sector. And we, th we think this is one um, valid approach. Um, on scaling up, coming back to your question now, um, Maisa, I, I think that there's, um, first of all, there's a risk around thinking that technology is the answer to scale up. And often we do have uh, investors and donors push technology at us. Technology is not a theory of change. Technology is an enabler. It is not a theory of change. So we, we have to acknowledge that. Uh, technology has its place. We, we also need to be very clear that without technology, without the modeling, the numerical modeling feeding the, um, uh, the, the forecasts, uh, without the artificial uh, intelligence that is increasingly being used in remote sensing, that we would be, be, be ineffectively blind in terms of a lot of the risk assessment and observation. But the problem is the people that own that risk are not the modelers, they're not the technology people. So, so we need to have a theory of change that combines that technology with, uh, with really uptake in, in a way that engenders action and trust in the system right on the ground. So that, that's one consideration around uh, scaling is yes to technology, but it's, it's necessary, but sufficient. I think uh, a second one is uh, around financing. And, and we may look back at, I, I believe we will look back at this COP and, and, and feel that this is the COP at which uh, the markets and finance started to shake hands with uh, the climate sector in a really meaningful way. I think where we've got real work to do is on these hybrid models, public-private financing models, uh, where actually we need something more sophisticated um, for those of us that are in effect creating a public good. But we don't want to rely solely on the, um, the financing announcements being made here. In the case of Daraja, we want to move it from the primary cities to the secondary and third cities. So we need a much stronger model. So those are my, those are my parting, perfect. closing thoughts on how we scale. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yes. And also, yeah, thank you so much. And, and, and also because it is very difficult to, and it, it's very so widespread that we have informal settlers in the developing world and how, how we get to them and effectively uh, is really necessary. Thank you. Thank you so yes. much. Uh, I would like now to introduce Beatrice Paggi, who is a social entrepreneur and co-founder of, okay, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, but in English it's called Election Climate, Climat des Elections, something like that, <laughs> an initiative of climate advocacy, and uh, she will reflect on what we have just heard today. All right, thank you for having me here. Thank you for the opportunity um, of my team with the High Level of Champions Climate Team. And I'm going to keep this very short because we also want to hear from Nigel and we also want to hear from all of you. So I only want to reinforce how important it is that we are elevating resilience to this level right now. Adaptation has always been this um, less loved sister uh, in this whole discussion. And it's so important that we have this right now because it's all about putting people in the center and looking at the people that are truly impacted by climate, act, uh, by climate change. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's so important as well that we explore the synergies between those two agendas because without stopping the emissions, we will, no, it doesn't matter how resilient we are, we still are going to have impacts that will not be in any way controllable and will only get harder and harder for us to survive as humanity. Um, it also is very important that we look at those grassroots and especially the historically marginalized groups 
that are not only people in certain regions and geographies, but this also scales with our social characteristics, such as women and girls, indigenous people, people of colors, and so many others that I'm going, not going to list here. And also, um, all those people are already doing so much action on ground, but they are not even aware of all the climate action they are doing because we don't attach this label. Because to them, this is a matter of survival, this is a matter of their day-to-day -day lives and livelihoods. So what we're doing here, really putting this in the center and developing a metric system that can measure how resilient they are, that's something that's game-changing to us. And I hope that with this, we can put resilience side by side with mitigation and that we can keep pushing forward this great work that we are doing here. There is still way more to be done and I'm very grateful to all the partners that are committing to this. We need to push for even more people to get involved with this agenda and that we put this, give this the importance that it has to, really has to have. And I really want to um, elevate as well one other speech that was made here that how important it is for us to put this into policy because policy in the national level is what's going to assure that this is translated to action and that we bridge the action to the policy and to the commit commitments we have here on paper and just on word. Thank you very much. Okay, I don't think I need to introduce the man. I'm so honored to have had the two champions uh, in, in the events I had to share today. So, Nigel, please. Thank, thank you so much. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to be very brief because we're going to be kicked out in three minutes. I think, so unfortunately, we won't have any time to, to, to have any um, comments from the floor, but we can, gather, we can huddle outside and hear anything you want to say. Um, Bia, first of all, thank you. Uh, she said it all, really. Um, um, and I want to thank Bia and the other youth fellows that um, joined the Champions team this year as, a, as an experiment, an experiment that's gone really well, like all experiments, with lots of learning on the way, but an experiment we're really excited to be continuing extending next year. Um, I also want to thank all of the speakers throughout the, 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 the two sessions and all of the partners. We now have over 30 partners in the Race to Resilience, and it's, their, it's them who are doing all the hard work. Gonzalo and I, the team, are just trying to lift up resilience as an issue, as Bia says, to give it equal standing with mitigation. We know that for many people in the world, resilience and adaptation are much more important than mitigation. Um, as, as Emma Howard Boyd, one of our ambassadors, says, it's a question of adapt or die. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, this is a really important day for me and Gonzalo, and I think for the Marrakesh Partnership and the High Level Champions. We're really thrilled that the Resilience Hub is here, and I hope here to stay for every COP. So thank you to David and Jorge and everyone. Well done. Um, we're, we're also really thrilled that, you know, the Marrakesh partnership used to be, the action zone used to be a corner of the COP where, where, where we all did our thing, and then there was this kind of mad trade fair. Um, two things have happened this COP. First of all, every day of the COP has a real economy theme, a real world theme. Today's adaptation and, and resilience, that's something the UK presidency has adopted, and I think the Egyptian presidency to come We'll continue that. I think that will become a theme, a way of organizing all COPs. Also, more collaborative thematic hubs like nature, um, cities, business, finance, um, and, and of course, resilience. So it's much easier for people who are not veterans of 20 COPs to figure out when to go and, um, and where to go. That, and that, that matters in terms of making sense. When I explained those two innovations as evidence that this was going to be the first action COP, to the youth delegates at Youth Cop, I got a round of applause because they can see that that's a move towards focusing on implementation. And we all know that's all that matters now is implementation. Um, uh, Bia's already mentioned the metrics framework, which he's helped a lot develop. I think really important. It will, it's something we're going to keep applying and learning from. Um, that's allowed us to see that all those partners between them are targeting improving the lives and livelihoods of over 2 billion people. Um, as Salim Hook, another one of our great ambassadors, tells us, the numbers don't tell the whole story. Um, last night we had a screaming of life on the front line. Um, very, very powerful film telling the story of forced climate migration in Bangladesh. Um, you know, the, the, the effects on lives and livelihoods. Um, so we've heard um, today from cities, regions, and a whole host of other non-state actors um, raising their level of ambition and committing to using their expertise 
and resources to build climate resilience depending on the local context. Um, and I'd really like to commend especially those regional governments and cities who are using the power they have to help their communities adapt and build more resilience. Um, Gonzalo and I spoke at the General Assembly of the Under Two Coalition, which is going to have to change its name because they're all focusing on net zero or 1.5 degrees, um, and many of them are already um, committing to work more on resilience. But we know we've got a long way to go. A lot of catching up to do with the intellectual work and the practical mobilization on the ground that's been done to make progress. So rest assured, I've got uh, Gonzalo has to step down in four days. Sadly, we'll keep him involved somehow. Um, but I've got another year. Um, you know, we'll be partnering with an Egyptian champion. Already had conversations that for them, an African cop, resilience is very important. So I think we'll have lots of support to really build on this momentum that you're all building. Um, uh, that I'm still a newbie act. I know some of you have been working on it for a very, very long time, but I'm excited to learn more and to help more. Um, importantly, it's not just a one day theme. It's the theme for today, but we've been working really hard to make sure that every day there are elements of resilience woven in to the whole COP. So it's both a deep vertical today, but an important horizontal. You know, if we're talking about finance or we're talking about cities or we're talking about food and agriculture, we have to be talking about resilience as well, right? Um, uh, I, I particularly want to thank all the partners who made the Resilience Hub a reality. That was a heroic effort to pull something kind of crazily ambitious together, um, very short time scales, under mad COVID restrictions, um, and over 100 partners have worked to make that happen. And, and the thing I noticed is that Resilience has m this really strong family feel, right, that people, um, it, it actually feels more human than mitigation. Mitigation is a spreadsheet. Um, uh, resili resilience is a family meal or a campfire. Um, so thank you for, for all of you. Um, thank the Resilience Hub with its fantastic program to keep a window open on resilience throughout the whole COP. I think we've achieved a lot together this year, um, but now we have the opportunity and the responsibility to keep building on that momentum. We have a duty to those who have suffered, who are suffering, and who will suffer from the worst impacts of climate change to imagine a better and safer future and then work on practical steps in local communities according to local conditions to help side by side with those communities who are often the most resourceful at a human level but need more resources and more solidarity from us. Um, I'm looking forward to working with all of you building this agenda next year. I thank you all for your hard work. And with that, I draw this Marrakesh Partnership Resilience event to a close. Thank you. Oh, and if anyone, if anyone hasn't got a Race to Resilience badge, then shame on you. But fortunately, I've got a few left. So you can have one before you leave.